Um, cool, we're going to look at um, the environment. And we've labelled it the anthropocentric environment um, because debaters don't actually really care about sort of the environment as a principal good a lot of the time. We care about the environment, how people use it, how people engage with it, what people can take from it. Um, and so when we talk about the environment debates, often the best way to weigh it is the way it impacts people, and that's the anthropocentric uh, lens there. All right. Um, in terms of what we're going to chat about, we're going to start by looking at some of the first principles, so environment debate, it's 101. We'll look at climate change, we'll look at natural parks, um, who use the environment, environmentalists, um, and then we'll look at some hot topics. We might have some time for urban environments at the end, we'll see. Um, cool. Are there any of those people like, wow, I want to spend lots of time there? The first picture looks pretty, I'd like to spend time there. Yeah, pretty good spot. Um, I'll buy Cosmosco here. Um, all right, so in terms of environment debates 101, whenever we're talking about the environment, we're going to have sort of fairly common themes come up. First one of these is economics. Um, this is things like tourism, the use of resources where we can reap uh, like wealth from the land, um, and also this uh, stability of land and ecosystems in terms of being able to continue to have tourists in them um, and use them long term. Secondly, you often have movement debates. This is just like hard or soft line movements. Should the environmentalist movement do something that is particularly like uh, disliked by the general public, but probably um, achieves their goals better, um, or should they like take a soft line approach, get lots of people on side, and do it through same votes or something like that? Um, then we have access. So questions like who can access the environment, uh, when and how can access it, and what purpose, um, and whether or not increasing or decreasing that access is good, and whether or not the people that get increased or decreased access are actors with particular in that debate. And then finally, protection. The way this often pops up in environmental debates is a sufficiency or maximalization issue. Um, so one team will say, well, we get the maximum degree of protection, but another team will claim that sufficiency is enough. So we get a sufficient degree of protection, and that means we don't really need to worry about this extra bit they get on top, and we should trade it off for something else instead. So if you're unsure about an environment debate, think back to those big one, two, three, four. Yeah, those big four, um, they're likely to come up and be fairly useful arguments Debate. Right, climate change. Um, so we're going to skim through this pretty quickly because, like, I think most people are aware of it. Um, I think that the average intelligent voter probably is aware that climate change is a significant issue. Um, is aware that it is like very, very pressing. Will have massive impacts around the world. Um, but the consensus of this from judges is often unclear or inconsistent. So spend time in debates making clear just how cooked the situation is, um, literally and metaphorically, um, because that's really important to get some of the impacts and climate change claims over the line. Um, it's to really push the directness of the imperative. All right, um, stats. So we're definitely going to get one and a half degrees warming. That's really bad. 71% um, of emissions come from the 100 largest polluting companies. Um, so that means that basically, the large majority of climate change emissions come from a very small number of companies. What this should do, right, is any arguments about people uh, making personal choices or like people's lifestyle changes being impactful on changing or affecting climate change should just be absolutely curb stop out of debating because it is just not true, right? You cannot, as a world, stop using enough plastic straws um, to like prevent climate change. We need to on a corporate scale. Um, and then 1.2 billion people is the number of people uh, that are potentially going to be displaced by climate change in the next 30 years. Let's say a lot of people, um, let's say a lot of human movement, and it's a lot of angry human movement too, right? Because it is people that have been pushed out of their homes because of the inaction of other parts of the world, and that's likely to create particularly contentious political and geopolitical issues. Um, any questions about climate change in debates? Awesome. Um, cool. Let's talk about national parks. Um, I think these are important to understand because they exist in a bunch of different forms around the world and general knowledge on them in debating seems to be very, very low, despite the fact they are a ubiquitous, sort of a somewhat ubiquitous um, national institution. Um, most countries have some form of national park protection. Um, and so the fact that debaters are not aware and we don't debate them more often, um, I would argue something that's like probably points to a lack of gap in knowledge in the circuit. <laughs> right, origins of national parks. Um, they're intended to create um, create to preserve the pastimes like the land agenda, right? These things like hunting, shooting, fishing, those kinds of things. Um, things like Theodore Roosevelt is into. Things Theodore Roosevelt, might have gotten wrong. Um, they exist now and there are a whole bunch of justifications. Um, there are things like ensuring people have access to really important um, environmental sites, cultural heritage sites, those sorts of things. They exist under claims of conservation, so make sure that we protect this land for future generations, to maintain balanced ecosystems, that kind of thing. And also um, for um, yeah, so conservation and then also the ability for us to 
breed and protect animals within those areas, and then just direct protection. So conservation is enabling us to perpetuate things long term, protection is just like keeping them safe right now. Um, cool, now, about 15% of global land is protected as national parks. The way that it's protected changes significantly between different countries um, and changes between even within countries, the level of like national park something is decided to be. Um, we've written them for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, yeah, any questions about national parks on that slide? No? All right, um, let's think then about whether or not the environment is how How's it going? Yeah. Um, so the environment is often considered a public good. Um, and the idea of that is that like it's not excludable. You can't really like keep people out of the environment a lot of the time. Um, as non rivals the idea there is that like actually um, one person's use of the environment doesn't necessarily take away from other people's use of the environment. So things like think of a lookout. Um, you know, to an extent, you can't really keep people out of it. Um, and you know, lots of people look out of a lookout. It doesn't take away from anyone else's views. But the issue with the environment is that as we increase that usage, we do get to a point of consumptive use where one person's usage does start to take away from another's, um, and that's a key issue in balancing the use of national parks, balancing the use of the environment, um, because uh, it does actually like, start to take away the part of the wider experience. All right, um, in terms of human impacts on national parks, so this is the reason that things become non like become goods that need to be preserved rather than just like goods everyone can kind of participate in. Um, so, number one, humans just cause mass amounts of erosion in the way that they create natural parks and um, the way they engage natural parks. So it's like when you walk along a track, you move soil out of that track just by the way you like walk along it. Um, when we build tracks, it changes the way water flows down hills, changes the erosion patterns in that way. Um, littering is a really, really big one. Uh, lots of people just like drop rubbish in natural parks. Um, and so even though it might not be the done thing in certain places, um, across a whole group or across particularly popular areas where you have lots of people coming who might not have um, the same attitudes towards preservation as other people engaged in the national park, you do just get build ups of litter and that kind of thing. Soil compaction is another big one. Um, so when you walk along a trail and you like squish the soil down over time, that makes it very difficult for things to grow in that soil. And what that means is maybe you do want the soil compacted in the trail, but when people start to take three or four steps off the trail fairly regularly, um, or they're like, you know, going up on a slightly off track part of the trail to get to a different lookout they want to go and see, um, they compact that part of the soil as well, but we didn't want it to be compacted. And now plants can't grow there, um, you get sort of corridors that are quite bad for like bad eco like diversity, um, and just limit the ability for nature to grow in those areas as well. Um, rock damage, people do a bunch of bad stuff to rocks. Um, they love painting and they love scraping them, they love carbon them. Um, just generally bad things. Um, is this? Yeah, cool. And you also have things like natural feature markings. That thing like putting this. Yes. Um, like oh, okay. Um, yeah, let me. Wait, so cool. Awesome. So, um, specifically, the harm of damaging rocks is um, things like rock stacking. Um, so, have you seen like the nice little rock stacks they do? Um, that sort of thing would probably fall within rock damage. What that does is it takes a set of rocks that have ended up in that position because of like natural forces that are homes and cover and habitat and protection for, say, like the, the crayfish or the yabbies that live in that river, um, or the fish or um, all the bugs that live underneath them. It lifts them up, it takes them away, and it puts them in a different place. Um, and then it knocks them over in a way that is more damaging than other forms of sort of natural positioning, right? Um, and so the key thing here is like that might not be like a huge impact in and of itself, but when it is multiplied across lots of use in a natural park, um, or it is done in a place where it has never been done before, that does start to have an effect that is um, something we probably should be concerned about. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, natural feature markings, just things like carving things into rocks, um, spray painting arrows on trees, that sort of stuff. Um, damage to that is like largely aesthetic, um, but also you know can be harmful in other ways. Vandalism, pretty straightforward. Um, it's good to note though here that damage to natural parks and the environment is not always super intuitive. That is things like there are some papers out there that point to the fact that walking causes more soil compaction and erosion than say riding through natural parks does um, because people's feet just like have bigger footprints on the ground than say a bike tire does. Um, or things like in canyon environments, turns out you can actually put a bunch of people through certain canyon environments and it doesn't do a bunch because even if people are walking through there every day, it's still not as big of an impact as like a massive log getting washed down there during flash flooding. Um, so these are some environments are just more robust to these sorts of events than others. Any questions about human impacts on national parks? Awesome. Right. Um, cool. We have other ways that we protect the environment in Australia as well. So national parks kind of are the highest level of protection. Um, we also have things like state parks. So this is like things focused on um, recreation and human usage. Um, this is like camping and boating. Um, often you'll see these things attached to uh, large forestry plantations next to um, dam reservoirs, that kind of thing. 
We have state forests. These are just like logging plantations we give people access to while they're not being logged. Um, they often have lots of walking, four wheel driving, mountain biking stuff through it. Um, and we have Aboriginal areas um, and state conservation, state conservation areas. Um, there are digital national parks, separate, different. Um, the key thing here is all of these have different levels of protection, and shifting land from one of these levels of protection to another level can be quite difficult. Um, and keeping land in certain zonings um, is really important for certain groups. So things like, um, I think, from memory, you're allowed to do things like mining exploration in state conservation areas. Um, and so mining companies obviously want land to remain in mining, you know, state conservation te uh, designations rather than say in national parks areas. Um, that's what. Cool. All right, um, so topic of classic for this one is that we should allow more private tourism development in national parks. Um, the case study on this is both caving and um, snow resorts. So caving is a classic that like, I think doesn't get a bunch of discussion, but basically, um, in like the origins of caving, it's this super rich, wealthy pastime because the only people that can take, a, take enough time off work and have the ability and resources to get out to the caves um, are the really, really rich and wealthy people. So they would go into this like, dirty, muddy caves in like full on like ball gowns and like tuxedos. Um, and so the original, and that's why like caves and like established cave rooms in New South Wales and stuff have really nice like accommodation attached to them, or, like a nice old caves house, because that was the kind of where the people would put up for the night while they went and viewed the caves. Um, and what that meant, they also did a bunch of like dumb rich people things, like they burnt their names into like the ceiling with their candles and that kind of stuff as well. Um, so, okay, so uh, the other one on this is snow resorts. So we rent out um, the land in Kosciuszko National Park, through Threadbow and Perisher uh, for their resorts. We make a lot of money off that um, to fund us to keep those parks running. Um, cool, so out here wants to characterize these developments as being particularly good and benevolent. Um, they're probably a dark with an environmental interest. Um, they have to comply with national parks regulation. Um, and you're probably modeling preserving some degree of low cost access. Um, the low cost access is particularly important. Uh, there's a walk that exists currently through the Grampians. Uh, that replaces an old walk that you have to pay to go on now. Um, the old walk is just a standard, like, it's like a 13 day hike. Um, but you could just go and do it, the campsites are low cost or free. Um, but now it is owned by a company, and you have to pay and do it on their time and on their schedule. There are not free or low cost campsites next to those, which reduces access to that walk, right? So you want to make sure you keep those access. Um, and you probably just push them, you get increased access to national parks, that is a good thing. People ought to be able to do these fun exciting things. Um, we ought to engage in the environment, um, at least to further protection of the environment long term. Um, if needed, you would counter, um, we'll counter with claims about how um, spaces aren't accessible in the first place. So you would discuss things like actually just requires a very specific set of skills to be able to enter these places um, and to be able to participate in these activities. Private tourism breaks down that barrier and that further increases access. Um, and you then look at increased uh, appreciation for the environment. Um, and then increase local economic engagement. There's just like local businesses probably benefit from these things. Those will be your big go-to impacts. Um, we'll talk about access at the end um, on that kind of barriers. On the negative side, you want to just be like, these are bad developments. Um, you would show up and be like, look, they're bad, they're exclusive. Um, the, um, so yeah, um, making existing walks exclusive, um, establishing new developments, um, only catch to luxury participants because these things are very expensive. You have to build them in the middle of nowhere. Um, they're very hard to do, so they are expensive to start up, so you have to charge higher prices when people do access them. Um, it, it, you then also just push for like, you would you would push on harms of excluded from these spaces. You would say, people had access to these spaces in the past, and they no longer have access to them. That is bad. You would push on the environmental harm. You do have to do you know a degree of environmental damage to build anything in the National Park. Um, and then you would aggressively mitigate um, or provide alternatives to any of the app benefits. So actually, here's why you don't get local engagement. It's probably all just like done by private companies who bus people in and out on the bus. They never really stop in the nearby town, um, that sort of thing, to mitigate that. Um, any questions on this topic, thoughts, extra bits we'd add? No. All right, cool. Uh, uses of the environment. So uh, we're going to try to do some more topic focused stuff from here on. Um, so basically, we're going to go through a series of different uses. And as we go through, we'll look at the way that their interests kind of conflict with each other. All right, indigenous groups. Um, so, classic for this is something like we should grant indigenous people um, control over all national parks. Um, these sorts of like access issues. Um, native so they are the first users of the environment in all kind of states. Um, native title is often very difficult to prove or obtain. That is because at some point in time, in basically every state around the world, a government has shown up and said we're going to make native title laws in such a way that it's very very difficult to prove. Um, and so it's quite difficult. Uh, and so they often do not have sufficient access. 
Um, the lands that they can access are often like quite degraded, um, have already been used for pastoral uh, uses, like had cattle grazing through it, done sort of desertification process where they, like the hooves like tap the ground and kind of stuff. Um, but also beyond that, even if we do give indigenous groups access and control over lands, um, the systemic deprivation of like financial capital um, and large corporations wanting to use this land often mean that trading that land in for harm, like potentially environmentally harmful uses like mining is just a good deal for these groups. Um, so although like the like rest of Australia may feel like it's pretty bad that we do like mining on indigenous land, for indigenous groups who have like suffered under centuries of like oppression and like systemic oppression of access to capital and that sort of thing, when mining companies show up and say we're going to pay you a bunch of money if you let us mine on this land, that seems actually really useful because it means you can give your kids schools and food and hospitals and healthcare. That seems pretty great. The other way this operates is a lot of the time the law might give people access to native title land, but won't give them control and will just require them to like submit an opinion on things. So, for example, in Australia, um, a couple of years ago, at the Jutton Gorge, where Rio Tinto blew up um, a couple of like really important indigenous cultural sites, everything they did absolutely legal. Um, they didn't actually break any laws in the process; they just committed like a significant moral wrong, right? Um, and so those issues they come up against. Even if you have native title or you have a say or the ability to have a voice over this land um, it is often not listened to or is often written out through legislation. Yes? Um, what does Native mean? Which one? <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Um, Alright, any questions about indigenous groups using land? Awesome. Uh, Alright, cool. Industry. Um, so industry is really like a key like user of the environment. Um, it's everything like logging, farming, mining, um, irrigation, all that sort of stuff, right? Classically, it's like we would ban insert industry here, right? So um, in Australia, logging in native forests is a big one at the moment. Um, they've recently banned a bunch of that in WA. They will no longer log, um, I think it's any native forest, it might be old growth forests. Um, this is important because it's a subset of trees that are very nice to make furniture out of, but only grow in like little pockets of WA. Um, so, Industry typically purchases the rights to extract resources. They buy access to the land, they pay a mining fee, that kind of thing. Um, and it's a key way that developed nations generate their wealth. So basically, every developed nation has made a lot of their money off just like stripping all the resources out of patches of their land. Um, but when you rely on stripping natural resources from your land, you create kind of a losing battle long term. Um, because you will always be selling those resources to someone who turns them into something with a higher value. So you'll never kind of be able to bump up into that group that's creating that sort of particularly high GDP. Um, and so, um, yeah, that means that like, although it may be really useful and really important for developing nations to have access to and the ability to do things like resource extraction from their land, um, you need to support it with other industries that actually process and develop those raw materials rather than just selling it to other areas. Um, Cool, environmental resources can be renewable, but they're often poorly managed. Things like trees do grow back. We can do fairly good plantation growth, but often we just don't do it very well because it's expensive or it's very slow. Um, this is one of the things about like, genetic modification of trees is something that could be really, really useful, but because the research on it is so slow, there are often not corporate incentives to engage in these sorts of things um, because you have to wait decades for your tree to grow to figure out whether the modification will work. Um, yeah, all right, log name forest is pretty sad. Any questions about the industry? Um, cool. We've got another slide on industry. Uh, so industry around the world um, is like, as we said, a key way in nature to generate incomes. Um, it provides a series of benefits um, all reap to different standards. So just because you are getting, you know, lots of money um, to a company doesn't necessarily mean you get lots of jobs, right? So things like mines often don't need a whole bunch of people to work on, um, especially in the developed world. Um, so, but for industry generally, and this is kind of, it's going to bridge into an FDI, so a foreign direct investment argument, um, in all sorts of things. So jobs, Directly, you'll be hired to work on this site. You'll be giving them um, income. They take home to their communities. They spend on their kids. They're like putting food on the table, that kind of stuff, right? Um, on top of that, you skill people up. So once you've worked in a mine, right, you give them that skill. Like I don't know, maybe it's like digging a hole, right? Like the bare minimum, or it's moving stuff, or it's um, making sure like the water is running really smoothly from one mine to the other, or to like the silage pit, that kind of thing as well. Um, you give them. You also are likely to develop like infrastructure. So you, if you have a mine in say like I don't know the middle of like the Northern Territory, you need a road to get there. So you're likely to build a road that gets you, you know, to your mine, and that road is probably usable by other people, or at least you're gonna build some more roads to connect it. This is particularly useful in, say, developing countries, where infrastructure is a huge government expense, they often don't have the capital or the, like, the, like you know, 
bunch of reasons they can't access or develop these things. Offering to corporations who are going to build roads to their mine or their factory can be really useful. Um, you then also get a tax revenue. So maybe you're doing things like mining taxes um, or uh, resource taxes, that kind of stuff, or just like directly tax the company's profits. That is money that goes to the government that would not have otherwise gone to the government. Um, and so at the end of that, industry can be really useful, has a huge number of like run on benefits, um, but is dependent on you proving why a company is going to provide you all of those benefits or the specific benefits that you want to target in that debate. Um, any questions about kind of the wider benefits of industry? Awesome. All right, um, urban industry and environment. So um, cities still exist in the shadow of um, redlining processes, racism, and class discrimination. So that is things like, often, industrial areas will just be very close to low CS neighborhoods. Um, and wealthy areas will be a long way away from them. And that means the air quality in low CS neighborhoods is often much, much worse. Um, because they have that massive levels of industrial runoff, those are the things. Um, zoning laws have meant those with the least power often live near the worst factory, we just said. Um, if you want to go deep on this, Joel, that's a really good piece on environmental racism. Would highly recommend. Um, cool. All right, recreation. So I've broken out recreation down into three groups. So I think this is the most interesting part for me. Um, and so we're going to go through kind of them individually. Um, the classic example of this is something like we would require permits or we would charge people to access um, all national parks. Um, I'll note here that a large number of national parks are free to access. Um, it is, you don't have to pay to go to all. And this is a misnomer I've come across quite a bunch recently. So uh, we're going to put that one out there now. All right, um, community groups, yeah, cool, we need all these in detail. So, um, individuals, so people love the environment, right? And all sorts of weird and different stuff in it. Um, and this has an impact on the environment, um, but also resources in terms of the way that we use it up. Um, so what we've seen recently, um, or recently-ish, is a significant increase in individual access to the environment. Um, this may be a direct, like, more percentage of people are in the environment, or our population has grown, and so just there are on debt more people going to the environment. What that means is that everywhere we've built stuff and put in hiking trails has more people going through it, and that's put a significant strain on lots of the environment, on lots like the national parks and facilities and infrastructure we have at the moment. That in the US looks like a large number of their most popular national parks having to put in permit systems to control the flow of people, so it's not just like packed out. Um, it means that when you have huge numbers of people going through the same spot, um, you do just get like more littering, you do just get more degradation, you get people going off and doing sillier things to try and get a better or a different Instagram photo, um, those kinds of things. And so it's just large numbers of people often start to degrade the environment. Um, people often do just like directly like damaging things in the environment, right? So things like four-wheel driving, um, done in the wrong place, long time, can just like rip up huge parts of like bush and that kind of stuff. Um, they often just like break stuff off, snap, snap trees, that kind of stuff. All right, um, classic for this then is that we regret the sharing of secret spots online. Um, this has popped up at a couple of tournaments. Um, this is big in the Blue Mountains at the moment because there are a number of like groups that are using the share like new, new spots or like secret spots to like drive on their like Instagram or like publish books that kind of stuff. Um, and so uh, there is a big question though whether or not we want more people accessing these. The specific example we've got here um, is a place called Fortress Lookout or Fortress Canyon. Um, which is this photo here plastered across the very nice um, looking magazine and has had a lot of like publicity fairly recently, right? Um, off that edge there um, is like a 60 meter cliff. It's huge, like it's really, really big and it's actually relatively easy to get to. You kind of walk along a ridge line and then you like dip down if you want to do kind of just the walking access. Um, and what that means is that lots of people are going there that haven't had a bunch of experience standing on the top of waterfalls before and they often like to stand very close to the edge of that waterfall. Um, or do other things like, um, you know, get drunk out there or litter, um, be quite noisy, that kind of stuff as well. Um, they're also walking on a track that's not designed for a whole bunch of people, it's designed for the odd person every now and again. Um, and so, the app case for this is that it's like these spots are really nice, um, more people getting access is utility. Oh, I think I've got this the wrong way around, but we'll figure it out. Um, more people getting access is like generally a beneficial thing. Um, and that, like people are inspired to care about these places. This is the wrong way around, so sorry about that. Um, the, sorry, uh, environment access, the environment should be accessible to everyone, um, especially because these areas are often inequitable in their access. So being able to like read the map, know where to look, know how to find these places, is a set of knowledge that is just like significantly gatekept over time. So for those reasons, we probably don't regret the sharing of secret spots online. Um, if we're arguing that we do regret them, so on the negative list here, but it's the app side, my apologies. 
Um, this one's just like fragile, they're under, underdeveloped for tourism, um, they are not ready to have lots of people coming through. In particular, the types of people you are likely to get through the sharing of spots online is a subset of people that are there for the, like, the view or the photo or the experience, that are probably somewhat more likely, definitely in debate land, to trade off environmental protection for their own experience. Um, uh, so, people access it badly, they do it in an unprepared manner. Classic for this is uh, this big walk down in um, Maroolan um, called the Bungonia Gorge Track. Um, and it's a 4.8k loop that does about 300 metres of vertical ascent and descent um, in like the span of two one kilometre sections, um, which is a really, really long, steep hard walk. Um, so, 4k four, four should take about an hour normally, it takes about six hours to do the Bungonia walk. Um, uh, but it's really pretty, and it gets lots of likes on Instagram, so lots of people go out and do it, um, and they get stuck halfway along, because there's also some like, large boulder hopping sections in the middle, and they're just not prepared for it, and so they have to go and get rescued. Um, and that's really, really what's intensive. Um, the classic of Bangonia was a few years back, um, they went down to rescue one group. Uh, while rescuing that group, they found another group that needed to be rescued. By the time they all got up to the top, literally everyone, including the police rescuers, had like heat stroke and dehydration. Um, so it's really, really intended to pull people out of these areas. Um, and so they probably just kind of well, or they just do it illegally, right? They just go off track where they shouldn't. Um, they do it in house. They make like bridge on the private property, that kind of stuff. Um, this comes at significant cost to the community. Um, so that is things like the community probably risks losing access to these areas. Often when people die in areas or when um, rescues become more common, access is reduced or made more difficult over time. Um, and this can also like, directly harm the environment so they can limit the access long term. Those are the big three harms you're going for at the end there. Um, any questions about this debate? Awesome. Alright, cool. Um, community groups. So, huge spectrum of community groups. Basically, they're like individuals, but there's a lot of them, um, and they have the scope to do things really well or really bad. Um, because um, they, they range from things like, things like scouting groups, um, adventure groups, like groups that specifically target certain activities, um, and they usually have like Facebook groups as well. Um, they have a really important role in increasing access. They're a really good source of information um, to drive people to get out there, learn new skills, that kind of stuff. Um, and they provide really good education all the time as well. They tell people what they should or shouldn't do. There's discussions online about how these things should operate, that kind of thing. Um, but when they're not operated um, or accessed responsibly, um, they can just cause significant harm because they do lower that act barrier to access. They do encourage people to go out there and do cool stuff. But if they're doing it in the wrong way, they do just cause more harm. Um, and that's kind of the trade they have there. All right. Um, they're also really good for mobilising them and creating change on a more sort of national or like you know issue-based scale. Um, so they often mobilise to create change. It looks like, looks like things like council meetings, um, like awareness and like support campaigns and letter writing campaigns. These are sort of the big three. So council campaigns is a big one for things like mountain biking in Australia. Um, is often driven by big pushes for local council meetings to put in mountain biking tracks that kind of stuff. Um, awareness and support campaigns are classic for things like um, any kind of environmental damage. And letter writing campaigns is the key one that, say, um, the Australian, um, some of the Australian conservation groups will pursue. Um, they'll put up sort of standard form letters that people can edit themselves and then send into like members of parliament and that kind of stuff. So they're made aware of issues that are going on. Um, case study for this is the Gardens of Stone State Conservation Area, which got bumped up to uh, a national park under the push um, from like quite a few years of a few community groups. <laughs> Um, the moment it got bumped up to a national park, the state government was like, great, we're going to make some massive tourism money off this, we're going to put a zip line and a rock climbing route in as well. Um, and then all the people that wanted to go from a state conservation area to a national park, like, whoa, 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 hold up, we don't want those things. Um, so there is that balance there, right? So they protected it from the oil mining that it was at risk of, because it was in an area with some shale oil nearby, um, but it is now, you know, their concern is now about the overdevelopment, over tourism of this area. Um, yeah, I think most interesting things about community groups in the environment is they often like viscerally hate each other. So you will have everyone from like tree hugging, like hard, like radical green, like the college, the college kind of stuff, to like people that are like subsistence hunters, both deeply caring about and supporting the protection of the environment, right? Um, and they will do it in very different ways, but they will both be pursuing the same goals, right? They want preservation, they want animals to continue to live on that land, um, the environment to be preserved. And that's a really useful thing, I think, at times, the debate to point out, is that it's just like a huge spread across different groups. Treating them as hegemonic, like singular, um, not very useful all the time. Um, they're also often just like disparate, spread out across lots of different causes. Um, and so um, it's important to have, at times, big and key things to unite them together to push for. Any questions about community groups? Cool. All right, commercial groups. Um, 
It's just like anyone who's like charging people, like doing paid tours in national parks and that kind of thing. Got the environment generally. Um, so, guided tours are a really big one because they often do really useful things. Again, they reduce that barrier to access and they can be really useful in like developing nations or providing work for local people in the area. Um, the question then is who do they cater for, right? So often it's quite expensive to run a guided tour company and so the tours are quite expensive. They often only cater to more wealthy groups um, and they often benefit from exclusive or controlled access. So it's really good if you're running a tour company or a walk company and you're the only people that are allowed there or you know, only paid tours are allowed in that area. Um, and that reduces access for other people who might have the skills themselves but not the wealth to go and do your walk um, to access those areas. They're able to lobby quite heavily at times um, and push for government changes, um, often do a lot of backdoors lobbying as well, that kind of thing, um, and you know, do lots of kind of deals behind doors um, and just looks like one to one um, because although certain things, certain aspects of their business model have to be approved or like building new things have to be approved, um, getting them to that approval process is often just like done by public servants or done through ministerial aspects in Australia um, at times. Cool. Um, they provide like a significant range of local work, right? So they do everything from construction of their facilities to like cooking and like preparing food for their like, you know, their, like clients, um, to the tour guiding stuff as well, and the cleaning at the end of all of that. Um, uh, but they can also lead to a strong natural environment which have lots of people out there doing these things. Um, who we cared for, got all that, yeah, cool. Um, all right, so classic for this then, it's like the developing nations should require all multi trips to national parks to be accompanied by guides. Um, so, this is used in certain areas around the world, but the debate's always going to push you to, to more areas. So classics for this, I believe, um, is it Mount Kilimanjaro in Africa? Yeah, cool. I don't know, remember the, uh, yeah, cool. Uh, Mount Kilimanjaro, you have to take a guide up with you. You have to pay a guide to take you up. Um, Mount Two Cool in Morocco um, requires you to have a guide and any kind of long-term parking in that area as well. Um, so the app shows up and just goes, well, these places often have high like, natural assets that are in high demand. Um, they should probably monetize them. Um, guides maximize true safety and experience um, because they make them have the most fun, most enjoyable time. They also just like, keep them all safe. They mean you don't have unprepared tourists going out and doing these things. They mean that like, maybe other um, geopolitical or other issues in the nation are less likely to affect people because they have tour guides there with them that are aware of those things to keep them safe. Um, Guides are unlikely to be prohibitively expensive because you are a developing nation, things are just relatively, probably somewhat cheaper. The people that are accessing these services probably also already fairly well off. Um, then you just put that bam. Two big impacts of this will support local economies and it will protect the environment because you have control of that access um, and you are employing local people. Negative team shows up and just count them on like a parks permit, some other way to monetize, excuse me, other way to monetize that asset. Um, you, they would then explain that guides are expensive, they probably reduce access to these things, um, and that is bad. They're also capacity limited. So things like mountain climbing, there are only a set number of people in the area that are really trained to do that mountain climbing, um, and so that reduces the capacity to have people go into that area, means you get less people coming to that, that area, giving them to the local, like, surrounding villages, that kind of stuff. Um, and then you uh, explain, like, like, a rule of practicality. Oh, yeah, you should, like, the practicality is, like, trying to figure out where you do or don't need a guide. It can be quite difficult. Um, and just, like, having to follow rules and, like, do other things is a pain in the neck at times. It really puts people off. Um, you should, like, there's other ways you can, like, have a lot of community benefit. We can emphasize them on, like, supporting industries, that kind of stuff. Um, that's the back and forth on that. Um, any questions? No? Awesome. Um, we're going to move on to hot topics now. Um, I will quickly note on hunting, so I actually don't think I have it in here yet. Um, in terms of uh, preservation of any kind of uh, environment, monetizing is always really important. This is particularly true, or the, the kind of go-to case study for this is game reserves in Africa, um, because often the animals kept on these reserves are just like threats or like damaging to local villages, right? Things like rhinos or lions are just like dangerous, or they do just like walk through your crops and stomp on them. Um, and so you need a reason people to care about these animals and protect them. Um, and that is often done by making them a key source of like funding for local economy. One of the ways we used to do this is by um, hunting them, and we actually still do it. And the way that we do that is, in theory, we choose a series of animals that are harmful to the population or are unlikely to contribute to the population, so like animals that are beyond breeding age but are stopping other animals from breeding, that kind of stuff. We say, um, and then we auction off the, like the permit to hunt these animals, and then we give it to like some rich like dentist in the US. They fly over, they spend a couple of weeks, they shoot the animal, they pay for a bunch of local people to like support them, cook them, drive them places, clean, you know, do all that, they set up a nice hotel, put a bunch of people. And in theory, 
portion of that money goes back to the local community. That's the way that's meant to work. Um, whether or not it does work that way depends on the specific area for that kind of thing. The less kind of like hunting folks by doing this is then to do things like photo safaris. And it's where you just like, you pay lots of money, you go to the game reserve, you take a photo. Um, there is some really interesting discussion about because the fact that these photo safaris are so profitable, um, driving them to get more people in and make more money from the safaris um, has potentially just sort of stepped over that, that point of consumptive use. So it's gone from that point where we can do this sustainably, lots of people, everyone gets to enjoy to where we are now, actively probably degrading the environment because of the services and process of engaging in photo safaris um, is reducing the quality of that environment. Uh, and it's all about that balancing act a lot of the time in these areas of debates. It's like, at what point do we switch over that consumptive use point? Does the debate achieve that? Um, cool. Any questions about that? Okay, hot topics. How many on time? Oh, we've got like 15 minutes of hot topics. Cool. We're going to finish this a bit earlier, but that's all right. Um, so, <clears throat> often we kind of like this idea of like wilderness um, and this kind of like untapped resource like no one's ever been. The issue is, um, it's a term like rooted in the denial of indigenous presences because when we say wilderness, we say no one's ever been there. We deny the fact like indigenous groups have almost certainly walked in those lands for centuries, uh, if not millennia, before um, you know colonizing groups came through. They're largely colonial, romantic term, <clears throat> which leads us to like the like conclusion like oh maybe we should like distance ourselves from the term wilderness. Uh, this is maybe a useful thing to do, but uh, we need to keep in mind the fact like the romanticization of wilderness is what allows us to protect it really really well. If we start to degrade that attitude of wilderness. Um, I think in a debate, you can definitely argue that that will lead to um, reduced protection of these areas because we no longer have this very up high idea of how protected this should be. Um, we probably are okay encroaching on it more often. Um, to give you a sense of how high the idea is, in the US there are national parks where like, uh, they are deemed wilderness areas and you're not allowed to use anything with a motor. Um, and I think it's some place that makes sense like a wheel. So it's one where they don't use wheelbarrows because that would like cross over human intervention into the wilderness. Um, so they pack everything in now with donkeys. Um, they do it all with like hand saws instead of chainsaws. Um, yeah. So we hold this term in really high regard, despite the fact that parts of it are problematic, um, because it just like does give us a degree of protection. Um, any questions about wilderness? Cool. Um, environmentalists and their high horse. Um, basically, like most of the stuff people use to engage in like sort of the more kind of environmentalist activities, right? Or you know, the stuff that people use to identify the non environmentalists. Um, it's often just like very deeply interwoven with the petrochemical industry. It's like any kind of nylon, most fabrics, large amounts of equipment a year is made out of petrochemicals. It is all plastic. Um, it's never really going to break down. There's some shifts away from it, um, but it is particularly like common. Um, and that's why we're um, back. We also do things like we drive a long way and we use a lot of fuel to get trailheads um, to access the environment. Um, and although this one doesn't have a direct impact, it is a high horse like check. But I think a lot of the time the environment is for to engage with um, and be aware of. Right, cool. Um, any questions from anything generally? Right, um, there's some wider reading here. Um, in terms of like uh, magazines and stuff, so I think the best thing to do is just like be aware of what is going on in environments near you. Um, so if you are in Australia following pub magazines, things like um, Wild is a really good Australian magazine, um, Outdoors is a good American magazine, um, they're both posted online. Um, even just the headlines is often enough to kind of keep you aware of these things. Um, really good, really useful. It also puts pretty pictures in your Facebook feed, so like it's great fun. Um, podcasts. 99% Invisible has a couple of really, really good ones on the way that trails are designed. So you walk along like a hiking trail and you're like, wow, we're like in the middle of nowhere, it's winding, it's supernatural. Um, turns out that's actually a really, really intentional design choice that is done through a series of very, very aggressive human interactions with the land. Um, and so this feeling of nature is aggressively engineered and designed, uh, which is really interesting. In terms of social media, it just follows like bushwalking, like follow National Park Services um, on social media as well. Um, also, just like find conservation groups. Um, the Australian Conservation Foundation um, is a good one. I guess the main one I follow. Um, yeah, any questions? Uh, awesome, thanks guys. <laughs>